Do you know? I'll give you a moment's time. Anytime. Can I be traffic seller right now? I see him. Good morning, Malacanang Press Corps and guests. Welcome to a regular press briefing. The presidential spokesperson, Ernesto Abel. Good morning. Today we have two resource persons. First from the Presidential Legislative Liaison Office, Secretary Adelino Sitoy. And the second one is from the National Privacy Commission, Deputy Commissioner Ivy Patdu. Secretary Sitoy finishes Bachelor of Laws at the University of San Carlos and Master of Laws at the University of Southern Philippines, both in Cebu. He will discuss the legislative agenda of the Duterte administration and some points on federalism. Also, uh, Deputy Commissioner Ivy Patdu obtained her Doctor of Medicine degree from the University of the Philippines and her Juris Doctor degree from the ADM. She will shed light on the Data Privacy Act and its connection with the implementation of the freedom of information in the executive branch. We'd like to ask now, Madam Ivy Padu. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, now in a country where we cherish freedom of the press, freedom of expression, openness, transparency, and accountability, we may often ask the question of what is the Data Privacy Act for? What is the data privacy and why should privacy matter? Let me start off by saying that the Data Privacy Act is about protecting individuals and protecting their personal information. So it's founded on the right to privacy. Uh, one of the more popular definitions of the right to privacy is the right to be let alone. Uh, it was actually from uh, writing made by uh, Justice Brandeis of the U.S. Supreme Court, but it started from a popular essay which was uh, written because of the fear, their fear of how technology and the press would unlawfully interfere with private life. You know? So this was one, the origin of this definition, but later on it became a definition that is said to comprehend, com uh, to become a comprehensive right, no? valued by civilized men. Why is this? No? Uh, the right to privacy is important because it is at the crucible of a lot of the rights as, that we enjoy as individuals. For instance, the reason that we are free from unreasonable search and seizure of our homes is because we have the right to privacy in our homes. The reason that we can invoke the right against self-incrimination is because of the right to privacy. Even freedom of the press, freedom of expression, it depends on how we are able to guard the anonymity of confidential sources of the press, how we as a nation, as a country, values freedom of thought. So this is what the right to privacy is about. It has long been enshrined in our uh, jurisprudence that it is a constitutionally protected right. So the Data Privacy Act applies to one specific aspect of the right to privacy. This is information privacy. So the law will apply whenever what is involved is the processing of personal information. So this law was brought about because of the changes that we have in the world. No, we live in the digital age. No longer will we have to, th to sort through files or documents. No longer do we need to wait for our newspapers to have information. It's practically at the tips of our fingers because information, as Senator Angara said when he, uh, he spoke about the Data Privacy Act, is the currency of power. So this law proceeds from the premise that personal information is valuable and it has to be protected. Next slide. So the Data Privacy Act does not say that the right to privacy is absolute. Neither does it assert to be a preferred right in the hierarchy of rights. What it instead says is for us not to, to ask the question of which right would prevail. 
It's not about asking whether freedom of information would prevail over the right to privacy. It's about putting value to these rights and finding a way to harmonize how they can both be exercised. Because after all, all of these freedoms, whether it's freedom of the press, freedom of information, the right to privacy, they are all rights that are critical to a democratic society. Next slide. So it is not, it's not intended to be a shield no, from uh, legitimate concerns about public interest or it will not shield government officials. No. It is easy to claim that the privacy becomes an obstacle to transparency and uh, public accountability, but its very provisions already says that it will not apply when the matter or the information concerns something about public officials. No? their functions, whether they enter into contracts, whatever benefits they receive from the government. No? The, the Data Privacy Act excludes that from its scope. Next slide. Okay. And it already recognizes the existence of other laws. No? So sometimes we would hear people say that we should find a law that will prevail over the SALN, for instance. No? But this law already recognizes the existence of these laws. It asks, again, for these laws to be harmonized. It considers as lawful processing any processing that is done in accordance with law. Like, for instance, any legal obligation, such as the obligations found in RA 6713 of the Code of Ethics of Public Officials or the anti graft and Corrupt Practices Act. It does not amend, it does not even say that it is attempting to amend these laws. What it just says is that because information is valuable, because it is important, then it must be part of the consideration when uh, discussing issues that concern personal information and personal data. So if we look at the law, the sal -N law for instance, what is the required fields? No? Real property, assets, liabilities, and net worth. Even if you look at this through the Data Privacy Act, these are not sensitive personal information. Therefore, there is no restriction, hindrance, or there's no need to redact this information because they are information uh, that are covered by the law. Next slide. But like all other constitutional freedoms, the right to information is not absolute. No? We say that the right to privacy is not absolute, but so is the right to information. It is limited to matters of public concern and information, uh, any other limitations that may be provided by law. And this law, uh, the SALN for instance, has been discussed already by the Supreme Court. And even the Supreme Court, next slide, recognizes that there may be limitations or prohibitions on access to SALN. So next slide. It refers to the law itself, 6713, which says that whenever user obtain, obtaining or use of SALEN is uh, the factor, then the purpose must not be contrary to morals or public policy. No. Second, next slide. And it also uh, recognizes the IRR of the same law, 6713, which says that uh, included limitations will be any disclosures that would put the life and safety of an individual um, to danger or any unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. Next slide. So I think what the Data Privacy Act is there for, because it applies to all the processing of personal information, is for us to be more circumspect when what is involved is personal information. For instance, if you look at the sal -N form, assets, liabilities, net worth, these are not sensitive information. These are the information required by law to be produced. But there are other information in the sal -N form that maybe we could evaluate whether it is still necessary and proportional to the legitimate aim of having transparency and good governance. So the sal -N form will contain uh, the, num the names, for instance, birthday of uh, children, minor children. It will be included in the sal -N form. ID numbers, no? home address. Now, uh, it has been a big issue about reductions of SALIN, but you know, even the civil service allows reductions of SALIN in terms of the home address. Even the Ombudsman Circular on uh, disclosure of SALINs, and even by practice, names of minor children and home address are, are already redacted. If it's a question of assets, liabilities, and net worth, then of course, that should not be redacted. That is part of what is uh, mandated to be included in any disclosure of the SALIN form. Next slide. So there are also some points about whether a government official, a public personality, still has a right to privacy. You know? Whether this right is uh, no longer available if a person chooses to be in the public eye. Again, 
uh, we can find guidance from the Supreme Court has discussed this in several cases. And the court said that a public official, yes, he has less expectation of privacy than other individuals, but this does not mean, next slide, that he is bereft of any constitutional protection as well. In fact, the very first uh, decision of the court which recognized privacy as a constitutional right is about the sal in. You know? There, the court said that there's, it's not a, an invasion of privacy if you release information about the assets, liabilities, and net worth of a public official. But it still emphasizes that you know, a public official is not bereft of any constitutional protection. Next slide. Uh, assuming a public office is not tantamount to completely um, saying that he has no rights at all. I know that politicians or government officials or public officials are under a magnifying glass when, when it comes even to their personal lives. No? But there are some matters that we have to be more circumspect about to evaluate whether it would be unwarranted already to invade on their privacy. So next slide. Okay. Because after all, the Data Privacy Act uh, is not really just a, it, it's a law, yes, that allows for the protection of personal information, but we must not forget that maybe what is involved is the higher right that is constitutionally guaranteed, and that is the right to privacy. And why should personal data be protected? No matter the, uh, no ma it doesn't matter who's the individual. No? The rights that are available to us should apply to all. If we become selective in the application of rights, or if we feel that any of the rights guaranteed by the Constitution are less important, then that will become a slippery slope. And all these rights in the Constitution are important to us, important for a democratic society. And personal information in the wrong hands, if it's an authorized use, it can be used for a lot of uh, harm. Uh, it could cause a lot of harm to individuals. So for instance, uh, you have uh, identity theft or the use of identity to harass people. Even when you look at, next slide, if you look at uh, the recent statistics of the Philippine National Police, incidents wherein personal information is misused has been increasing, including identity theft. Next slide. Okay. So next slide. Okay. And of course, when we think about uh, important uh, considerations like public policy or, or what is uh, necessary for us, we have to question whether what information we are requesting from the SALN is really necessary and proportional to the purpose of accountability and um, accountability and good governance. No? Minor children, for instance, should they really be included? Would it detract from our purpose of having a clean government if we redact the names of minor children? No? Because they are after all, part of the public policy of the Philippines in accordance with international conventions, Convention of the Right of the Child, our Constitution, and a lot of other laws is to protect the best interests of children. So uh, these are considerations that must be made. No? We must not jump into immediately saying that the right to privacy is not important because after all, when it concerns a public official, we have to look at his family as well, including minor children. So next slide. And uh, if you look at the experiences of other jurisdictions, no, even the personal address is really a cause for personal safety and security. No. Uh, siguro nga, parang minsan you feel that politicians or government officials may deserve this, but let's also think of their family. Um, here, this one is a government official from uh, Melbourne, and this is what he said. Himself, he felt was fair play, but when it concerns his house, where his family lives, then he feels that it's already over, overstepping. And these are the dangers when we don't, uh, or when we forget uh, the importance of how this personal data should be protected. If we think that it's just routine that should be released without thinking of their value. Um, next slides. I think these are more examples. You know, where politicians sometimes stand for unpopular belief, and they can be victimized too. They can be uh, attacked. You know. um, next slide. And uh, let's not forget that the Data Privacy Act does not just apply to politicians. Most certainly not, but it is a law that is applicable to everyone. It aims to protect the rights of everyone. And if we start saying that there are exemptions from the protection of this law, then it will be difficult because it upholds a basic right. In this case, yes, she's a public personality. And, and uh, I think if there was a Data Privacy Act in this case, there, there would be less uh, problems because she was attacked by her stalker. She was an actress in the US. She was attacked by a, by a stalker because uh, the stalker obtained her address from their uh, registry motor vehicles. 
yung DMV nila. So later on, a law was passed that said that you know, home addresses should not just be released. So I think this is the same principle when we are faced with questions that involve personal information. Next slide. The Data Privacy Act should not be used as a shield uh, to shield public officials from scrutiny, especially when, it are ma when these are matters that are of legitimate public concerns. But neither this, should this law be ignored or, or should be set aside when what is involved is personal information. Because this law is for all of us. In a democratic society, right to information and freedom of the press is important. But equally important is the right to privacy because without it, then there will be a problem with a lot of the other rights that we enjoy. Information privacy is necessary for safety and security, and it is for us to enjoy what we should enjoy as a democratic society. Both these rights are important, and both these rights should be zealously guarded. So, yeah, thank you. MPC, questions for Deputy Commissioner Pat Do, uh, Tina Mendez, Philippine Star. Microphone, please. Good morning, Good morning ma'am. Ma'am, how, how are you assessing the provision under national, uh, the Privacy Act that exempts personal information to, to be used for journalistic and research purposes? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for, for that question. Um, the Included in the scope that where the Privacy Act will not apply our information that are processed for journalistic, artistic, and research purpose. This means that journalists are given greater flexibility. In fact, this is not the only section in the Data Privacy Act that allows protection of journalists. It reiterates the protection given to confidential sources of uh, uh, journalists. So this means that when you publish these matters, you will be judged only whether it is uh, libelous, uh, the regular limitations on, on freedom of speech, whether it's uh, putting a person in a false light, uh, whether it violates any law. No? But you're not prohibited from using information uh, which you feel is important. Again, the balancing of interest will come here. It will be determined whether uh, in your uh, processing of personal information for journalistic purpose, whether it can be balanced or whether there is already a lack of balance with privacy. No. So, so, so ma'am, in case journalists ask for silence of public officials, including cabinet members, does it follow that it should be come in form na may reductions agad-agad? Because if a journalist asks for it, di hindi pwedeng, pwedeng hindi agad invoke yung National Privacy Act. Uh, if a journalist asks for it, then uh, it will be according, in accordance with the purpose. No? So perhaps the question that should be asked, I'm, I, by the way, uh, I think the civil service is uh, drafting its own guidelines and the National Privacy Commission will also be issuing an opinion. But just to address that uh, issue, it should be asked what is the purpose. For instance, what is the purpose of knowing the exact home address of a politician? No? Uh, but this can be appealed, I think. No? Under the FOI framework, even if the names of the minor children, for instance, have been redacted because of the public policy of putting the best interest of the child at hand, which is an acknowledged prohibition under the 6713, uh, the, then you can appeal if you feel that it's important for your journalistic purpose, the names of minor children. No? But then when you weigh it, uh, the public policy involved and the connection of the names of minor children and their birthdays to the interest of transparency and public accountability, then uh, perhaps we have to give to consideration also to the policy of protecting the interests of children. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dexter Ganibe to be followed by Ace Romero. DZMM, Dexter. Good morning po. Um, kasama po ba yung... Uh, mga personal bank accounts sa mga pinoprotektahan ng Privacy Act? Well, the, the Privacy Act considers as sensitive personal information those classified by law as privilege. Now, bank accounts, uh, they are also protected by another law, the bank secrecy law. No? But the SALEN requires you to put in the amounts and uh, it also includes a signature of the person that allows the ombudsman to look into all this. Remember that the ombudsman, for instance, when it accesses silence, it's without any reductions at all. And they're given also the additional power 
to ask other government agencies for any additional documents that will verify the salient. So as to the purpose, remember that these are filed without reductions. The original remains unredacted without any defacement at all. It is there. It is only when disclosing certain sensitive information, perhaps, that you should weigh it against the interests of privacy, especially if the privacy concerns are no longer limited to the government official but involves his family who is not in public service or involves children or involves information like government ID, which can be used for uh, perpetuating other crimes. No? But as to the assets, liabilities, net worth, I think the law is clear. 6713 is clear that this should be disclosed without reductions. Uh, natanong ko po kasi, uh, ano po ang take ng Privacy Commission dun sa mga official ng government na naglalabas ng mga private uh, bank account numbers uh, pinapublicized? Well, um, whether it's verified or not, no? uh, they may be in violation of the law, but that's not for the National Privacy Commission to say. And any decision of the National Privacy Commission or opinion on that matter would have to depend on the particular circumstances of the case. No? But a lot of laws will be involved. Maybe the bank secrecy law, maybe uh, the code of ethics of journalists when they publish it, uh, maybe uh, many other laws. But as to the, the Privacy Commission, uh, that's considered sensitive personal information. But if it's being published by a journalist, then the flexibility given for purposes of journalism may apply. Oh, kasi natanong ko po yun kasi yun yung naging isa sa mga grounds nung sinampa ni Senator Tevillanas laban kay PCOO, Assistant Secretary Mocha Ozon. The... Uh, yung pagpapublicize <laughs> nung kanyang account number, offshore account number. Okay, I cannot, I cannot comment on that. Maybe it will be, <laughs> it will become a subject of our, a formal, maybe a formal opinion, no? But, uh, again, this is the purpose of the law, no? And this is the beauty of being in a democratic society, that we can debate about whether one should fall into the right to privacy sphere, whether it's already a matter of public concern. Even when the Supreme Court discusses matter of, matters of public concern, it says that it has to be decided on a case-to-case -case basis. So it doesn't mean, if you're a public official, hindi ka uh, exempted dun sa Privacy Act? Sabi ng Data Privacy Act, pag public official ka, Lahat concerning your office, your function, kung nag-enter ka ng contract with the government, may nakuha kang benefits sa government, hindi siya covered ng Data Privacy Act. Dinedelineate lang siguro what is uh, in relation to the function and what are private matters. And whether it's a private matter is up for discussion because what is legitimate public interest, it can encompass a lot of things. So that's why it has to be decided based on the particular case. Kasi, like... Pag tinanong mo, for instance, bank account versus names of minor children, baka mas wait na dapat bigyan natin ng privacy yung names ng minor children over something that, you know, is a matter, might be uh, decided as a matter of public concern. Okay, thank you, Dexter. MPC, we still have uh, Secretary Sitoy. Last question, Ace Romero. Uh, Commissioner, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. <coughs> Sorry. Correct me if I'm wrong. You mentioned uh, acquisition costs of personal and real properties are not sensitive and therefore they need not be redacted. Is it yes. correct? Okay. Yes. But there's a PCIJ report recently uh, stating that some cabinet officials redacted this crucial information. Do they have any li liabilities, if ever? Well, if uh, I think that uh, Ase Kablan here will be able to clarify that. Maybe you should rec try requesting it to them again, and there will be no reductions. If ever any reductions were made in the past, perhaps it has been clarified already in the past few weeks that those information are not, uh, they should not be redacted. So they should not be redacted? They should not. Be, they should be open to the public and they should be included in the salon. And I think that if you request for those same documents with the freedom of informa information, they will be released without reductions of acquisition costs. Are there liabilities, if ever, <coughs> for those who redact those? Uh, it will be decided on whether there was good faith, whether they, were, they were, whether they were trying to comply with the law, whether there are so many factors to consider. No? Uh, but if a complaint is filed before the National Privacy Commission, for instance, on why those were not disclosed, uh, it will be determined uh, it, will, it should be addressed first by the proper body, and I think they have addressed it. Can you educate us on what are the possible sanctions if a complaint reaches your office and then it is proven that they deliberately they redacted those information? What can be the possible sanctions? 
it will be a, it will be actually when you talk about freedom of information that's strictly not for the National Privacy Commission to decide because what the National Privacy Con Commission is concerned about is individual rights. So if you're an individual and your right is violated, then that's the time you go to the commission. When it's about freedom of information, then other uh, laws will apply, whether your constitutional right to inform no, no information on matters of co public concern will be involved. That could be civil. A lot of laws may apply to that. No? But, but for the National Privacy Commission, it's about you as an individual and your own information. So if you feel, for instance, that you're, it would be the, the other way around. No? If there is unwarranted disclosure and uh, you put in danger people because you process their information, use their identity, you process information for the wrong purpose, then that can be covered by the Data Privacy Act. And the sanctions under the law are quite hefty, you know, imprisonment and fine. Regarding the addresses, it's understood that uh, you do not put the exact address because it could, you know, be a, mm. it could pose a security risk or an invasion of privacy. But are there mechanisms to scrutinize an official's <coughs> residence to make sure that he is declaring, he or she is declaring the correct information? I think the civil service will be issuing uh, guidelines on how specific uh, the location should be. And for journalists, I think it will, there are a lot of ways to find out the exact address given the address that, or the location that is provided in the sal in. No? Kasi may mag issue ang civil service dyan. As of now, ang alam kong guidelines ng civil service, it has to be specific enough but not exact. Specific enough that you will be able to find out where it is. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, thank, thank you, Ace Romero. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Ivy Patdo. Can we now have Secretary Adelino Sitoy? Salamat. May buntag stanen. Good morning to the Malaganyang Priscor. I'm going to give you an up, up, update on the federalism campaign uh, initiated by the administration. Starting from the House of Representatives, there was a concurrent uh, House Resolution number 6909 uh, submitted by the Committee on Constitutional Amendments. Uh, last February 15, and then uh, the the resolution was to constitute the Congress of the Philippines as a constituent assembly for the purpose of proposing amendments to or revision of the 1987 Constitution, and then uh, the resolution of both houses. Uh, consolidated into number eight, resolution number eight, um, filed by Congressman Gonzalez and Dibera. Again, uh, resolution of both houses constituting the Senate and the House of Representatives, seven Congress, into a constituent assembly. And uh, these uh, resolutions were referred to the Committee on Constitutional Amendments on August 8, 2017, chaired by Congressman Roger Mercado. <clears throat> the committee adopted a working draft, the proposed presidential bicameral federal draft constitution contained in uh, resolution uh, number eight and it created four technical working groups to deliberate on the proposed measure. Um, TWG1, the Executive Legislative Relations, chaired by Congressman uh, Malanyaon, and TW2 on the Judiciary, chaired by Congressman Fred Castro, TW3, Preamble National Territory, chaired by Representative uh, Benitez, and TWG4, Articles 1, 11 to 15, Accountability of Public 
Officers, National Economy and Patron, Patronomy, Patrimony, Social Justice and Human Rights, Education, Science, Technology, Arts, Culture and Sports Family, chaired by Congressman Biloso. In the Senate, <clears throat> there are pending uh, in the Committee on Constitutional Amendments and Revision of Codes, headed by uh, Senator Pangilinan. Uh, these are the resolutions <clears throat> or Senate bills. Senate Bill Number 128, filed by Senator Subiri, an act constituting a constitutional convention to amend the 1987 Philippine Constitution. Defining qualifications for its delegates who shall be elected uh, simultaneously with the October 2016 barangay election should have been, uh, this was filed earlier, but this is now overtaken by the postponement of the barangay election. Resolution of both houses Senate Resolution number one, authored by Senator Drillon, calling for a convention to propose amendments to or revision of the Constitution of the Republic of the Philippines. And joint, Senate Joint Resolution number one, authored by Senator Gordon, joint resolution to propose amendments to or revisions of the economic provisions of the Constitution. On the part of uh, <clears throat> the executive department, the uh, cabinet approved my presentation of roadmap to federalism. Uh, and uh, by reason of that approval, we, uh, under we started to undertake our information drive uh, on the principles of the fundamentals of federalism. So, on March 30, 31, in Quezon City, the PLLO Congressional Chiefs of Staff held an interface uh, activity. On May 23, 2017, at the Malacanang grounds, we tendered a dinner and briefing on federalism with the new lawyers of Cebu. Uh, on June 6, 2017, in Tugigarao City, we had a briefing on federalism and a workshop. On June 29, 30, in Makati City, we had a Makati Federalism Summit. On July 4 to 5, 2017, in Quezon City, we had a PLLO Congressional Chiefs of Staff Interface Activity. On July 11, 2017, in Tumagiti City, we conducted a federalism briefing and consultative workshop. On August 17 to 19, Cebu City and Mandawi City, and uh, involving the whole province of Cebu, uh, we uh, conducted a perspective horizons and impact of federalism project. On August 22, 2017, at the Bailiff Hotel in Tamuros, Manila, we had a briefing on federalism and consultative forum with the Comelic Employees Union. And in Bacolod City in August 25, 2017, we had federalism briefing and consultative forum in Bacolod. September 14, at the Belief Hotel, we also had a, the coming of change, federalism in the Philippines, the impact of to our youth and future leaders. <clears throat> The upcoming activities will be held on September 27 in PUP Santa Mesa, Manila. And <clears throat> also, we have scheduled similar activities in Lucina City, Naga City, and Lipa City. Uh, 
Those are the updates on our campaign for federalism. In regard to legislative priorities uh, of the 28 uh, common legislative agenda, one had become a law, the uh, Free Higher Education Act, and uh, the others are already on second and third reading, including the uh, uh, Indo, in of Indo, Security of Tenure Bill, and the utilization of the COCO Levy Fund. And of course, the comprehensive tax reform, which is now in the Senate. And this will be the subject of a bicameral conference between the House and the Senate. Those are all. MPC, you have questions? Uh, Philip Tobesa, to <coughs> followed by Dexter Ganibe. Microphone, please. Where's the microphone? Good morning, sir. Nakahanap na po ba ng sponsor for the B BBL sa Are Congress? I beg your pardon? Na nakahanap na po ba ng sponsor, ng lawmaker na magsisponsor ng BBL sa Congress as a Senate? Sponsor of? The BBL, sir. The proposed bank sa... BBL? Uh, apo. Oh. Uh, in regard to BBL, we already submitted to Congress, the House, and the Senate a draft bill for their consideration. And I think the House will be ahead of uh, in filing a, a copy of that bill uh, so that it can be referred immediately to its committee, pertinent committee. Sino po sa House ang magfa-file at kailan po kaya ito may file I think it's the Speaker who will be uh, uh, filing the bill himself. At kailan po ito uh, expected na ma-file, sir? Hindi pa. Hmm. Bakit po natagalan na bago makahanap ng sponsor for the law, for the proposal? Uh, I, I, I do not know. <laughs> Ay, ah, sige, sir. Uh, ano pong mauuna? Would you expect the BBL to uh, be approved first or yung campaign natin for federalism, char charter change? Uh, side by side, I think. Both are important. And uh, during the last leadup, uh, it was agreed that uh, the Bangsamoro bill will also be pushed through. Do you think, sir, the BBL would be uh, passed before the year ends? Uh, if there is some delay, but I think uh, a good progress uh, can be had before the year ends. Which means, sir, could you elaborate on that? Before the year ends, we hope to have the bill uh, already on second or third reading. Oh, okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Dexter Ganibe, BZMM. Isaac, may buntag. Check. I'm, may buntag. Do you have update on the, uh, um, what do you call this, the barangay, postponement of the barangay NSK election? I learned it is already uh, approved in third and final reading at the Senate. Uh, when will be the bicameral conference committee? Uh, I don't know the schedule yet, but uh, that is already passed by the Senate. And uh, considering uh, the uh, little difference between the Senate version and the House version, uh, although in principle they have already agreed to consolidate uh, the two versions, uh, in due time, uh, it will be submitted to the bicameral committee, but I do not know the schedule. Uh, Joseph Morong, microphone. Thank you. Sir, ang sa Congress daw po yata, I think the House has adopted, uh, no, the Senate has adopted the House rep uh, report on the SK, effectively postponing both houses. No? Now, it's being readied for the President's <coughs> signature. When it reaches the president, do we expect na pipirmahan na rin niya yung 
postponement of uh, the elections, the Barangay and SK, considering his past statements of, uh, you know, Barangay officials being involved in uh, drugs. I'm sure the president will sign it because uh, he issued a certification on urgency. The uh, only difference was on the date with respect to the date of the next election. The House version uh, cited uh, May uh, 2018, but uh, the Senate version uh, cited uh, October. And I think in principle, uh, the uh, House is agreeable to uh, October. And do we expect the president also to just uh, to agree to an October uh, rescheduling? Uh, I, I think the, um, during the bicameral conference, the October schedule will be carried. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Sir, on the BBL lang, where do we, sir, dun sa 28 common legislative agenda, was the BBL included in that list? 28. 28 common legislative agenda. Ah, yes. Was the BBL in that, uh, can we call this a priority list? Yes. This is the common legislative agenda with reference to the 28 uh, items. Mm -hmm. Common in the sense that uh, the items were agreed upon between the executive and Congress. So how would you, where would you, how would you describe, sir, the importance of the BBL as far as the legislative agenda of the Duterte administration is concerned? Um, <clears throat> uh, all of these 28 were included in the uh, presidential legislative agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, in short, uh, the Congress had agreed uh, to the uh, items listed in the presidential legislative agenda of the 55 items originally listed, the 28 uh, had been agreed upon by Congress. So there is no point anymore in uh, not having this facilitated in both houses. Mm. Okay, sir, thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, questions? Uh, Philip Tubesa. Last question for Secretary Sitoy. Philip Tubesa. Follow up lang, sir. Yung sa BBL po uli, uh, you mentioned sa House expected ang um, speaker, ang um, sponsor. Meron pong reports na sa Senate, it's the Senate President who might sponsor the bill. Confirm na po ba yun? Uh, I'm not sure about uh, the Senate, but uh, even in the House, uh, considering that we submitted uh, the uh, draft bill to the speaker himself and to the Senate President, uh, unless the the opt to find another author, we would expect them to author the bill. So, hindi pa rin po confirm yung sa house on the part of the speaker. Uh, not yet uh, firmly confirmed. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Secretary Adelino Sitoy of PLLO, Presidential Spokesperson Ernesto Abella. On EO 42, the President signed yesterday Executive Order EO 42, number 42, defining the powers and functions of the Subic Bay Metropolitan Authority, SBMA Administrator and Directors. EO number 42 likewise repealed EO number 340, series of 2004, which separated the position of the SBMA Chairman chairperson from the position of SBMA administrator. EO number 42 directed that the appointed SBMA administrator of the president will also be the ex-officio chair of the SBMA board. On the postponement of Barangay and SK elections, the palace welcomes the move of the House of Representatives to adopt the Senate's final version postponing the Barangay and SK elections. We expect the President to sign the proposed bill into law. On the NPA government clash in Batangas, the government is currently monitoring the situation in Barangay Talumpok, Silangan, 
in Batangas. The military is on top of the situation and will release updates as soon as the information becomes available. Um, on other matters. Philippines is the most prepared ASEAN country on infra buildup. The Philippines is the most ready in increasing infrastructure buildup among ASEAN countries, according to the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. The country's preparedness is attributed to its substantial financing opportunities, the government's tax reform program, rising avenue collection, revenue collections, and the declining debt ratio. On high heels. All right, starting last September 24, private workers, particularly women in retail and our service employees, assembly line workers, teachers, security personnel no longer have to wear high heels as the Department of Labor and Employment has fully implemented their department order number 178. Mm. The order aims to prevent health risks for women, including strain on the lower limb, and so forth. In addition, employers are required to provide rest periods or shorten the time spent on standing or walking. Accessible and comfortable seats should be provided as well as installation of appropriate flooring or mats which should lessen the impact of prolonged standing and frequent walking. On the surrender of nine NPA bombers. The surrender of nine NPA bombers including the turnover of powerful improvised Explosive devices in Sultan Kudarat is a positive development in our efforts to restore peace and maintain order in Mindanao. Many lives and pro properties have been saved because of this action of the communist rebels who are trained to make and use powerful bombs to return to the fold of the law. The efforts of community and the local government in working out the surrender of the nine NPA bombers are to be lauded. Regarding an incident at the PSG compound, per PSG spokes Mike Aquino, it's still under investigation, and they will issue a statement on the matter soon, <coughs> soonest. Today, uh, 26 of September, day 127, um, uh, a rundown on a few statistics. Um, enemies killed 707, or an increase of 12, Civilians killed 47, no change in civilians rescued, no change in firearms recovered, killed in action 151, buildings cleared 11. As of 2.30 p.m. 25, uh, 25th of September yesterday, uh, the status of cash donations for the Marawi AFP casualty, we now have a total of 103,062,182.78, and Marawi IDPs, 59,395. We are open to a few questions. Dexter Ganibe, DZMM. Microphone, please. Hi, ah, Isaac. Well, Good morning. Um, two issues lang po. Yes. Una, yung sa EO 42. Opo. Uh, does that mean um, SBMA Chairman Martin Dino was a strip of his powers? Or Sinibak? Uh, the there'll be a new, uh, I think the, an, an announcement will be made shortly as soon as the appointment papers are signed. So, He will be appointed to another, do you mean? Uh, let, uh, let's just wait for the announcement to be made. Okay. Yes? Follow. Appointment papers, tama po. May have appointment papers kay Martin? Uh, I did not say. Uh, there will be new appointment papers which will be announced later. Okay. Sa and an appointment paper. Sa yeah. SBMA pa? Opa. Okay. Sir, on the on second matter. Follow up muna sa EO42. Okay, go. Um, Raymond Tinasa, Bombo Radio. Sir, uh, what prompted the president to issue Executive Order 42 aside from that issue of confusion of functions and powers? Um, as far as I know, so according to the OES, when they made a study, uh, they saw that uh, it was actually the the two positions were Originally, according to RA, uh, the Public Act, it was supposed to be uh, two offices in one person. So I think they reverted to that. That is what they reverted to. So was Chairman Dino consulted with, it, with this EO? Or, uh, I mean, informed before the release of the EO? I'm not privy to that matter. 
However, uh, let's just wait for the announcement that will be made shortly. Uh, last question, sir. How's the relations between the president and the new? Uh, I wouldn't know. I'm sure. So I suppose civil. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, follow up about EO, uh, Philip Tobesa. I sir, clarify lang po no kay Chairman Dino. You mentioned appointment papers. Does this mean he's paper. on his paper? Does this mean he's on his way out? Uh, ano po? Does this mean he's on his way out? Antayin na lang po natin yung paper na ilalabas, mami. It will be out shortly. Tina Mendez, you have a question? Uh, okay na. Uh, Dexter? Na. Sir, you're saying uh, as uh, Chairman, SBMA Chairman Martin Dino, will be uh, reappointed sa SBMA. Uh, regarding, his, uh, re regarding any of those matters, uh, that, that is beyond me. Uh, the only thing that I can say at this point is that the two offices have been conflated into one position, in, into the two offices will be, un, uh, will be assumed by one person. And that would be Martin Dino or... The, Let us uh, wait for the appointment paper. <laughs> Sir, may, may lumalabas na mga binabanggit, um, Martin Dino will be given a position sa, DI, sa DILG as other as secretary. Uh, hindi that? ko rin po alam yan. I, I cannot say that. Thank you, Dexter. MPC, no more questions? Okay. Laila Salaveria. Yes, ma'am. Microphone, please. Last question na si Laila. Hi, good morning, sir. Good morning, Sir, Laila. given the National Privacy School... Privacy Commission's position on the salad. Can we expect no reductions of acquisition costs and anything pertaining to assets and net worth in future I, requests? I think, as uh, the good uh, commissioner earlier said, that uh, if you check again, they will give you the full. Uh, so the, the palace will follow that. <laughs> will the palace follow that? <laughs> Come again. Except the names and the other, except those other items that were pointed out oh, earlier that cannot be included, yes. So all information pertaining to their assets, liabilities, and net worth will be made available in full? Apparently, yes. Okay, thank you. Tama. Okay, follow up. Oh. Follow up. Sir, uh, rephrase ko. Now, if there's a request again of the sal-ins of the cabinet members, will the new release not cover or show the acquisition costs of uh, the assets? It will show. So if requested, you're willing? If requested, yeah. So can we request now? <laughs> from me, not from me. But <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any can other we have uh, as Assistant Secretary Chris Ablan to answer Joseph Morrow? Yeah. You want to explain? Yeah. Uh, yes, just to continue where the spokesman mentioned, uh, uh, if a request is made because of the guidance from the National Privacy Commission and we also uh, had a meeting amongst the uh, six sal and repository agencies yesterday as already scheduled prior, uh, and uh, we learned also that uh, four out of the six sal and uh, repository agencies do redact the names of the unmarried minor children and the uh, home address then uh, those will be redacted upon request. So the acquisition cost and the total uh, net worth, uh, the total uh, assets and the total liabilities uh, w will, will be disclosed. Okay, so I, I don't think we have a quarrel whether we have to release or not the private matters. Na parang, given naman yun, na, fine, wag mo nang ilagay yung mga bata. No? Yes. But as far as the details that will show the wealth, no? yes. acquisition cost, whatever, you're willing to reissue, no? The, yes. the silence. Yes, that will be disclosed. Also, in the meeting yesterday, uh, it was it was found out that the uh, civil service is actually calling a technical working group this October, uh, and will be reviewing the sal and guidelines, and may also include the revision of the sal and form itself on whether or not to include the names of the minor children if there are no business interests at all. Remember that in the sal and law, the only reason why you have to declare the names of the children is if they have any business interest. If there are none, then there might, they, there might not be a, a need to disclose. Also, uh, as mentioned already by Deputy Commissioner Patdo and Spokesman Abelia, uh, there are several occasions wherein the affiance or the declarants do declare more than they need to. 
uh, there are there are several silence not only of cabinet members but also of lower rank officials that show the uh, uh, bank account number, the plate number, uh, which uh, need not be uh, already in the sal in form. We have expressed our concern with the Civil Service Commission, uh, and they may put a, a guideline or a warning in the new sal in form saying that they do not need to uh, uh, put the uh, bank account number and the plate number of their motor vehicles because there's no need for those uh, information. That actually is the source of the uh, issue of the Malacanang Records Office and other sal and repository agencies, what to do with that information if volunteered uh, by the declarants. Uh, and so uh, th those are the things that uh, ha were discussed yesterday. No commitments, no decisions made, but at least the different sal and repository agencies knew what the other agency was actually redacting. And it's surprising that uh, a majority of them do redact the home address, and the minor children. So next time the journalist or any public, uh, the public would request for uh, the sal and of, uh, officials, uh, we, will f we will follow the practice of redacting the home address as well as the names of the unmarried minor children. Okay, last question on sal and Ace Romero. Asik, uh, may we just know who was be or who were behind the reduction of the acquisition costs of personal and real properties of the officials. Uh, on, on what is this? Uh, because there's a report uh, stating that some of the sal ends of officials, uh, yung mga information about uh, acquisition costs of real and personal properties were redacted. Yes. May we know who are behind those? Those reductions. It, it's possibly the one of the sal and repository agencies. There are several. There are seven sal and repository agencies: the civil service, the ombudsman, the office of the president, the court administrator, the clerk of the supreme court, uh, the senate, and the house of the representatives. The report was citing the sal and of cabinet officials. So who's the rest of repository of? That's the that's the Malacanang Records Office. But uh, uh, you have you have to understand, uh, as we are implementing the Freedom of Information, we are also implementing the Data Privacy Act, and uh, the whole implementation of the FOI program is a learning process. As I mentioned in previous occasions, the implementation of FOI in the U.S. took five years. The implementation of FOI in Croatia took ten years, and the president told us to implement FOI in 120 days. So there will be some challenges along the way. The agencies who have um, mentioned that there are concerns in the disclosing of the sal and and other documents such as the personal data sheet, we actually uh, sought uh, advisory from the National uh, uh, Privacy Commission. We asked uh, for clarification from the National Privacy Commission in terms of the personal data sheet and they did issue advisory number 2017-2. We likewise asked the National Privacy Commission to guide us on the appreciation of the uh, sal and form and uh, they have yet to respond. As already mentioned by Deputy Commissioner Patdu, they will issue a guidance uh, later on this year, but also would have to defer to the de decision of the civil service. So it's not, <coughs> sorry, it's not the official themselves. It's not the officials themselves who sought the reductions. I don't think so, no. Okay, thank okay, you, Ace. Thank you, Ace. Last question, Dexter Ganibe, Presidential Spokesperson Ernest Albella for, for you. Yes, sir. Magandang uh, tanghali. A statement lang from Palace uh, regarding dun sa shooting incident sa PSG compound. Uh, Is it? Would the Palace express concern dahil yung shooting incident nangyari mismo sa... Uh, presidential security group compound kung nasaan na roon ang bahay na tinitira ng Pangulo, hindi ba nakakabahala may nangyaring ganito sa loob mismo ng... It's, uh, being, it's being investigated and uh, the, the nature of the situation needs to be uh, clarified. Uh, let that be sufficient at this stage. Hindi ba na Come any again. concern from the... Come again. A, any statement of concern from the uh, presidential spokesperson with this incident happened inside the PSG of, compound? Of course, it's a matter of concern. However, we need to clarify what exactly it was all about. It, we don't know the exact nature of the, uh, of the incident. So we need to be able to find out exactly what it was. Where is the president when the shooting incident happened this morning? Um, I, I haven't clarified. Is, we don't have any information regarding that. Everyone okay. here is Manila today, sir? Today. Um, I need to clarify that. 
Okay, thank, th thank, you. thank you. Okay, thank you, Dexter. Thank you, Presidential Spokesperson Ernesto Abella. Thank, thank you. you, Secretary Adelino Sitoy and Deputy Commissioner Ivy Patdu. Back to our main studio sa Radio Pilipinas and PTV.